Hello and welcome to the second presentation on the process and origin. Thank you to everybody that reached out and gave me feedback for the first presentation. I was overwhelmed with the response. This presentation is going to be following on from that in a lot more depth. So I suggest if you haven't watched the first presentation to go and do so, because without that, you're probably not going to understand what's going to be in this one. And here's the usual disclaimer. Um, I do own shares in the company exploring in this region. This presentation doesn't constitute any investment advice whatsoever. I'm not a financial advisor, so if you want financial advice, seek out a professional. Um, I've tried to use the most recent data, but some data may change in the future. And historical performance is not a reliable indicator for future performance. So just um, what this presentation is going to be covering. We're first going to review some of the key points from the last presentation, specifically around the geology. We're then going to be talking a lot about the granites and metamorphism in the region. We're then going to go into Telfer in a lot more depth, followed by Haveron, and then we're going to bring it all together to compare and to essentially create a model for how Haveron might be formed. So this is just a reminder that um, about the gold occurrences in Western Australia, where we're located. So what we tend to find is that the gold occurrences in Western Australia are all located either within these cratonic regions or on the craton margins. Um, so we don't want to explore in regions that don't host the, essentially the oldest rocks in Australia. We want to be focused on the regions that do contain the oldest rocks, which are these cratons. And that's illustrated on the left a little bit more clearly, where we can clearly see that the gold circles that you see or the yellow circles on the right line up with these cratons. This is just the geological map of Western Australia. The red square is actually the location we're in, which is the Patterson or origin. Um, the Patterson origin formed through essentially continental collision. Uh, this collision uh, is kind of done in a few different phases. But in essence, what we have is the Yulgarn in the south and the Pilbara in the north. We call it essentially a collision between them sets up something called the Capricorn origin. And then we've got additional um, convergence from the east that then on the east. Uh, eastern side of the Pilbara produces the Patterson origin. Um, we have rock types ranging in Archean age all the way through to Phanerozoic, as seen on the left illustrated here. Predominantly, the rock types, the rock ages within the Patterson origin are from the Paleoproterozoic all the way upwards to the Phanerozoic, where in the Neoproterozoic, this particular region here is where we host our gold mineralization. Uh, we're now going to zoom in on that square, and what we see is essentially a series of faults that uh, occupy the origin, and that the um, main deposit group that we're interested in is actually in the Yanina Basin. So this Yanina Basin group of sediments is actually what hosts the mineralization at Telfer and also the other gold deposit in the region. This sequence was intruded by a set of granites um, over here, and that the whole thing is actually underlain by this metamorphic complex known as the Rudal complex in the south. So this is just a recap of the tectonic events in the region. So we start with something called the Yapunku orogeny, which is the main orogenic episode that causes the metamorphism in the Rudal complex and is caused by the continent continent collision of Western Australia's craton with the North Australian craton around about 1.8 billion years ago. If we then skip on from that, we deposit the Yanina group sediments in an intracratonic rift setting uh, linked to the breakup of a supercontinent known as Rodinia. Uh, this is around 910 to 820 million years ago. We then have the most uh, important orogenic event in the region, known as the Miles orogeny. In the last presentation, I gave an age of 650 million years. That's actually the tail end of the Miles orogeny. The actual start date is either, the, is either at 750 million years ago or potentially up to 840 million years ago. However, I prefer the younger date. Um, this is a deformation event that caused basin inversion. It's linked to the granite intrusions. And it's also caused the metamorphism, which is all together very important in creating our mineralization in the region. And then we have a later origin known as the Patterson origin, which is around 550 million years ago. 
and it seems to have seems to have reasonably low impact on the sediments overall maybe adds an additional metamorphic input but it's the miles orogeny that is the most important on this list uh, this is just another diagram showing essentially all of that information put together um, so where we have our Rudal metamorphic complex which is our metamorphic basement we have an uh, what is known as an unconformity which is essentially a big time gap between the Rudal and the next sediments that overlie that which are the Yanina basin group sediments now the Yanina group is split into two subgroups which are known as the frostal range which is those uh, three units and then the lamel group which are these three units here and it's the lamel group that we're interested in because that is what hosts the mineralization at Telfer. We then intrude all of that by these uh, granites known as the O'Callaghan Super Suite. And we then, once we can move past the Patterson origin, we then start to deposit our Phanerozoic cover, which is the Cannon Basin sediments. And there's a particular group that I always find funny called the Disappointment Group because it has nothing in it. So just a bit of a focus on the Lamel group again. We talked about it being a regressive sequence, which basically means that there's been a drop in sea level. And that drop in sea level is progressively then depositing from the base sort of uh, mud, more mud rich sandstones or mudstones. And then when we um, go up towards where the Wilkie Quartzite is, which is the top unit of the Lamel group, that is specifically coarse grain sandstones that would have been deposited probably in a coastal, maybe even desert environment. So when we talk about uh, coarsening, cleaning upwards and this regressive sequence, all that means is that we're changing from finer grained, mud rich sediments into coarser grained, sandier sediments with potential for carbon as well. Um, and as I said before, Telfer is hosted within the Malu formation. The top member of the Malu formation is actually called the Telfer member. And that this whole sequence would have been intruded by these granites. And that all of that information I've just kind of spoke at you is illustrated here. So this, if you want to refer back to, is a really good starting point and reference point for the rest of the presentation. Specifically now, we're going to focus on the Lamel group, the Miles Orogeny and the O'Callaghan's Super Suite. OK, we're not really interested in anything down here. We're only really interested in this red box that I've highlighted here. And in terms of overall tectonic setting, I've just pulled up this slide from the last presentation. Based on the observations I've talked about and the evidence presented, we are located within a continental arc or accreted terrain setting, which is formed within a collisional plate boundary. Now, I talked about the two types of collisional plate boundaries in the last presentation, but based on the evidence and the observations presented, we are located within a continental continental convergence plate boundary whereby we have two continental masses that are colliding together that is going to produce uplift and a mountain range and thicken the continental crust which is going to enable the development of granites in this particular part so the regional tectonic setting for the patterson is a continental continental convergence setting this is just a quick summary of that as well um, Feel free to read it. It's the same as last presentation, um, but we're going to move on from this now. and We're going to bring this geological context and sort of look a bit in more in depth, the granites and the metamorphism and how that can generate mineralization. So let's first talk about metamorphism. So metamorphism is defined simply as the changes to a rock composition and or the structure of a rock induced typically by pressure and temperatures above 200 degrees Celsius and 300 megapascals. If I want to simplify that further, basically, if you take a rock and you put it under more temperature, more pressure, you will start to change the minerals in that rock and also the texture of that rock. And that is what metamorphism is. This diagram on the right is what geologists call the metamorphic facies diagram. It's a very important diagram. Because essentially, when we find a metamorphic rock, depending on its mineral assemblage and depending on what texture we see, we can estimate the temperature and the pressure and sometimes the depth 
that particular rock has formed that. So what do we see in the Unina group? Well, the rock types in the Unina group have been subjected to something called green schist facies grade metamorphism. That's a, I put a star within this box, but what you can see is that green schist is within a pretty narrow temperature range, but over a range of de uh, pressures, and we can form it over a range of depths. Um, the particular type of metamorphism that we have got in the Unina group and in the general Patterson origin area is what we call regional metamorphism. Regional metamorphism occurs over a very wide extent. It's not localized, it's pretty wide, and is often linked to continental um, and convergent plate boundaries. We also get another type called contact metamorphism. Contact metamorphism is always associated with, or typically associated with, intrusions, either granite intrusions or even mafic intrusions. And it's a lot more localized and it will form essentially any uh, a low pressure and high temperature grade metamorphism. So we do see some of that around the granites within the Patterson. However, typically the most dominant metamorphic footprint is of regional metamorphism. So I mentioned granite, so let's talk about them in more detail. So on the left hand side, we have a diagram from Artemis Resources website where we see a zoomed in version of the Patterson origin where we're hosting the mineralization and these isolated red blobs that are the granites within the region. Now, collectively, these granites are known as the O'Callaghan's Granite Super Suite. But in reality, these are actually individual granite episodes that have been grouped together under that name. These individual granites are illustrated on the right hand side from a more recent paper and previous authors collectively. And what we have is the Wilkie granite, which is located here. The O'Callaghan's granite, which is actually the youngest granite, not marked on this map, and hosts tin tungsten mineralization. In the north, we have the Mount Crofton granite and also the Minyari granite. OK, and this is intruded in all of the stratigraphy that I highlighted previously. And later on, we're going to be talking about the links between these granites and the mineralization. So the O'Callaghan's Granite Super Suite comp is comprised of four different granitic bodies as outlined in the previous slide. Now we're going to go over a little bit of jargon now. OK, it's important to go into a little bit more depth for these granites. So these granites are actually known as I-type granites, which stands for igneous type. Now, some of you out there may be wondering, well, aren't granites igneous anyway? And that would be correct. However, what we mean by I-type granites is that these granites are formed by melting igneous rocks. If we melted sediment rocks to form a granite, these are known as S-type granites. Okay, but the composition of these granites in this region are indicative of I-type granites. Specifically for those geologists out there, they are either cyanogranite or biotype monzo granite. So in the individual granites, we either have the presence of magnetite or ilmenite. Now, these two minerals will tell us or infer whether or not the granite was oxidized or reduced. Now, most of the granites contain magnetite and are therefore oxidized. Only the O'Callaghan's granite has ilmenite and is reduced. OK, that's the youngest granite and is highlighted by the red dot over here. Now, in terms of the ages of these granites, I've, plotted, I've put a table here from this paper. And what we see is that these granites have been dated in discrete periods. One around 650 million years, 645, the next in 630, and then the last, which is the O'Callaghan's, in 605 million years. Now, this is important because it shows you that there's a 50 million year emplacement window in these granites, and they've occurred in discrete episodes. Now, that's important because it might be that not all of these granites are linked to mineralization. So when we tie back the mineralization age date from Telfer in, in, and align it with one of these granites, it's not going to align with all of them. In fact, the Telfer mineralization only aligns really with the oldest granites which are part of the Wilkie granite and the Croft and the Mount Crofton granites, which are these oxidized granites. And this is just a reminder of Telfer. So Telfer is the biggest Neoproterozoic gold mine in the world. It is hosted within the Malu Formation. 
it has lots of different styles of mineralization, but mainly it's got these reefs, this stockwork, and this breccia mineralization at depth. And that is thought that we have a mix of hydrothermal or metamorphic input into the system that's creating, um, that is able to scavenge the metals and put them up into the Malu formation where we can mine it. So this is another quick update from last presentation. You'll notice now I've changed the uh, mine life estimate for Telfer. I've done this now based on reserves because reserves are the economic portion of a resource. OK, so now when we do that calculation, we divide the 2.2 million ounces by the production in 2019 of 450 ish thousand. We then get a mine life of around four to five years, which is a lot more in alignment with, with the consensus um, of analysts and other estimates by individuals. So this is just Telfer in a little bit more depth again. Telfer is hosted not only within the Malu formation, but in a particular structure we call an, an anticline. I do define an anticline in the previous presentation, but essentially all it means is it's, it's a folded unit where the oldest rocks are in the center and the youngest rocks are outside. So what we actually have at Telfer is two doubly plunging anticlines that are trending west-northwest at about 310 to 320 degrees. And that within uh, that anticline, we've hosted the mineralization in the Malu formation, specifically in these reefs, which are located higher up, which are just simply bedding parallel or parallel uh, mineralized uh, layers. And then at depth, we tend to get more what we call discordant veins and also breccia and stockwork mineralization. And that's kind of illustrated in this uh, example here and this example here from uh, the 2016 Schindler paper. OK, and we do see the breccia. We know about the breccia at Haveron. We're going to get back to the different mineralization styles at Haveron later on. So it's good to bear this in mind. And I went over last presentation that there are two different models of formation that are kind of proposed for Telfer. OK, so the first one is this Rowan's model, which I've illustrated on the right hand side here. And what this says is that where we have a granite, we can produce the heat from the heat from the granite will drive circulation of pre-existing metamorphic fluids. And that these pre-existing metamorphic fluids with the right with the right uh, composition of fluid can uh, scavenge out the metals that are contained within the sediments. OK, so that's our gold, that's our copper, it may even be little parts of lead in there as well. We then, uh, because of the circulation and because of the heat, we can take those uh, metals out into the fluid. That fluid can move up basement faults, it can move up fractures, it can move along bedding planes, and it's essentially going to move along until it reaches the Malu formation, which has the right uh, lithological properties to essentially uh, host the uh, mineralization, the gold and the copper. And that is where we have deposited our, that gold and copper, okay? The only difference between this model and the Golnitz model is that the Golnitz model, which came before, suggested that the granites actually have more of an influence, and that is the granites that are supplying the metals, and that is the granites that are supplying more magmatic fluids than what is proposed in the Rowan's model. And there's been a lot of debate since these two models have come out by numerous authors, and I'm going to showcase that off in later slides. And we're going to come to a conclusion as to whether or not the granites are important or not important. What is important on this slide, however, is that despite all of this and this was and obviously all of the observations by those authors and subsequent authors, we have now characterized the Telford deposit as what is known as an intrusion related gold copper deposit. And this is a very specific type of deposit. It's a very unique deposit, which is why it's been so difficult by numerous uh, geologists and authors to come up with um, essentially a set of criteria. So looking at the mineralization at Telfer in a little bit more depth, I've already talked about the different styles of mineralization. So we get these um, bedding concordant veins or reefs here. We get discordant veins and stockwork, and we also get breccia. And I've illustrated all of these down in the bottom right. Now, some authors think that this particular arrangement of mineralization actually occurs in that order. So we start with the reef mineralization, and then an another hydrothermal pulse comes in and produces the discordant veins and stockwork. 
as seen in the second image on the right, and then we produce the breccia at the end. There are some authors that have said that they all close at the same time, so it's a little bit debated, but the point is we have those three styles. Now, what do we see in terms of mineralogy uh, texture, the, the assemblage associated with the uh, ore mineralogy? Well, we see a lot of quartz. Okay, so this is, uh, if you don't know what quartz is, it's just SiO2. Um, if you ever go to a beach, the sand is predominantly quartz. We then get carbonate. If you don't know what carbonate is, that is uh, CaCO3, and that is uh, calcite. Okay, that is essentially the constituent of limestone. Okay, um, if you want dolomite, dolomite is just where we put in some magnesium into the structure. Okay, and it's typically the um, the dominant carbon uh, mineral we find in the geological record as it's more stable. We also get muscovite, which is a mica mineral, metamorphic minerals, which are the ones associated with the green schist facies uh, assemblage. Uh, typically is going to be actinolite, tremolite, maybe some chlorite, very green coloured. Okay. Uh, in terms of the sulphides, which is the economic part portion, or at least the bit we're interested in, we have predominantly pyrite and chalcopyrite. These are uh, pyrite, which is an iron sulphide, aka falls gold, and chalcopyrite, which is the dominant copper uh, mineral, is a copper iron sulphide. This is the mineral which pretty much most copper deposits around the world explore for. We have some uh, late stage supergene uh, copper minerals, uh, bornite and chalcosite in this case. And we also have the occurrences of minor pyrotite, galena and sphalerite, but these aren't really that important. The main importance is within the pyrite and the chalcopyrite because that is where the gold occurs. Because the gold occurs as free gold inclusions within those sulfides and filling in the cracks within those minerals when they were deformed and occasionally occur as tellurides, but we won't worry about that too much. So within the reefs where we have a lot of pyrite and chalcopyrite, we also have a lot of gold because the gold is contained within those minerals. In terms of alteration, um, I'm just gonna define alteration as the, uh, water, specifically the rocks uh, around the deposit being affected by um, the fluid that is incoming into the, the region. And this process is known as metasomacism. I've defined it over here. It's basically when we flush a rock with a reactive fluid, it's gonna change the composition of that rock through the introduction or removal of particular elements, okay? Specifically at Telfer, the alteration is most intense around the veins and the breccia. That's to be expected because essentially the fluid is either gonna fill in the, the fracture to create a vein and therefore the reaction zone around that will reflect that and around the breccia where essentially overpressuring of fluid can create a breccia. So when the fluid passes through the different cracks, it will cause an alteration. And typically the alteration zone uh, patterns we see at Telfer um, are in some way affected by the type of um, rock it's interacting with. So a more calcareous component, we get sericite and carbon alteration more quartz rich, we get silicification. The other common thing we see is tourmaline. Tourmaline is a boron silica. This is very indicative of a magmatic input. We see this a lot in granites. If you go down to Cornwall, you'll see a lot of tourmaline. But another important observation is we don't see very large alteration zones. And we don't see a lot of metal zonation. And by metal zonation, I mean getting gold and copper in one bit and maybe lead zinc in another. OK, the gold and copper is present everywhere and so are the same minerals. And because of that, 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 that if you was to see the opposite of that, that would be more indicative of a porphyry copper or IOCG system. Because we don't see that, this deposit type at Telfer cannot be characterised as an iron, copper, iron oxide copper gold system or a porphyry copper deposit system. This is a slide just focusing on the granites around Telfer again in a little bit more detail. So the mineralization age at Telfer is located down here in the veins. These veins have been dated at around about 640, 650 million years ago, which is located at the same time as the granites. Specifically, it's located at the same time as the older granites, the Mount Crofton and the Wilkie granite. It is not related to the O'Callaghan's granite, which is here. Now, the O'Callaghan's granite is a reduced granite, whereas the older granites are more oxidized. 
But so that kind of suggests that the interaction of the granites over time have become more reduced over time. And the, in, and the interaction of the granites with the sediments and the fluids locally is, pos, is probably the cause of that. Because typically what we see in the fluid inclusion is that these fluids are reduced. So the oxidized fluid that comes off the granite in the older granites is reacting with the sediments and the fluids in the country rock and becoming more reduced over time. There's a lack of spatial relationship with the granites, however, because the granites are located 10 kilometers or so away from Telfer, which contradicts the Golnik's model, which said that they were spatially related. The last point that the authors down here state is that the granites aren't necessarily important because only one of the groups of granites may be linked that the later granites, even though they're chemically similar, aren't providing any metals to the system. That is one possible explanation. The alternative explanation, really, is that the older granites have potentially supplied the metals and that the subsequent granites, which are kind of related to potentially the same source for the granites, are simply tapping a resource that is now more metal poor because the earlier granites have taken the metals out of the system and have already contributed them to the system. OK, so a couple of different ideas there. But the point is, is that the earlier granites, the older granites are, at least in terms of the time frame, linked to the mineralization at Telfer. More evidence for the magmatic input comes from fluid inclusions. Fluid inclusions, I want you to imagine if you was to take a fizzy drink and freeze it. The bubbles would be would be within the ice and the comp and it will trap the composition of that bubble. That is what a fluid inclusion is. So what do we see within these fluid inclusions that are trapped? So essentially are freezed um, fluids or, or and, and or melts. We see these fluid inclusions within quartz crystals. And when we probe them to test the composition and when we do experiments to work out what temperature they were, what we find is that these fluid inclusions are high salinity, moderately high temperatures, and have a lot of base metal content. This is typical for magmatic hydrothermal fluids. We've got a different couple of different parameters to suggest that the fluids are reduced. Like I said, you know, the fluid has originally been oxidized and now it's changed to reduce. But we also have the presence of carbon dioxide and methane. And it's these that also give evidence that they could have come from the granite. There is no evidence for a meteoric water component. Therefore, anybody that originally would have thought of this to have been some form of epithermal system has no legs to stand on. OK, so the fluid inclusion data matches a magmatic hydrothermal input. And I'm now going to summarize that all together. So what at Telfer, we know it's an intrusion related gold copper deposit. We have evidence that points to both magmatic hydrothermal and metamorphic fluid input, but no meteoric. We've got a strong temporal overlap or time overlap with the granites and the mineralization at Telfer. However, the distance between Telfer and the granites is quite large. It's at least 10 kilometers. So there isn't a spatial relationship. We don't see big zonations. We don't see big alterations. Zones, and we don't have any real significant uh, occurrences of iron oxides. Therefore, this deposit type cannot be characterized as an iron oxide, copper, gold or a porphyry copper deposit. The source of the metals is still debated, but I believe it's likely the sediments and that the granites provide heat and additional fluid input that combine with the metamorphic fluids to produce the gold copper mineralization within a structural framework. So where we find these mineralized layers typically is within the, the, the peaks of the anticlines or within veins and fractures. So moving on to Haveron then. This is a timeline I've created of the different explore, exploration that has been done over time at Haveron by various companies. So we start around about 1986 with Newmont, then we move into the new crest ownership, which lasts until about 2010. And then there's a bit of a time gap until Greatland Gold acquire it in 2016 off Pacific Trends. And then obviously recently we've entered into a, a joint ventureship with Newcrest as of 2019. Okay, so originally they did some aeromagnetic surveys, there's been drilling done, some sampling, but we'll kind of pick it up from here where on this left hand diagram we have the aeromagnetics 
the ground magnetics and the ground gravity anomalies all overlaid onto one map. So between all of that data, what we find is that we have a set of drill holes kind of located on this black line here that kind of marks the boundary to the Haveron prospect because this intercepted some very low level um, mineralization, not really any mineralization present of any quantity there, but it did identify some anomalous hematite alteration around the edge, which is seen as a distal peripheral alteration. And then here on the right hand side is the current uh, arcuate sulfide zone, as it's called, mapped at depth with the various intercepts. And what we see is very high grades uh, intercepted within this sulfide zone by the Greatland Gold and Newcrest drilling. So this is just zooming in on that diagram from the last slide and the report in 2005. And what we see, as I mentioned prior, is that we have some drill holes on the edge here, which kind of mark the boundary to the deposit. And I've kind of drawn that on a little bit inaccurately. OK, and that all of these holes in here are drilling this or at least attempting to drill the centre of the deposit. Now, within the 2005 report, they mentioned that the best drill holes produced anomalous copper and gold mineralisation, mainly within veins and within hydrothermal breccias. And we know that the breccia is a big thing at uh, the Haveron district now. They also commented on some of the alteration and over time, the alteration names have kind of changed over time. But specifically, they mentioned that the best uh, drill holes were in contact with ferrous and magnesium rich metasomatism. Now, ferrous iron is iron 2 plus. Ferric iron is iron 3 plus, And that's where we get the hematite. We don't get the hematite where the ferrous and magnesium rich metasomatism is. Magnesium rich and ferrous metasomatism is typically where we get more silica and more carbon. Um, we then sent nine core samples off for further analysis from Mason Geosciences. And that is summarised on this slide here. So what do we see in the rocks at Haveron? Well, we have a series of calcareous siltstones and sandstones, some limestone, some clastic siltstones and sandstone, and also some minor shale. So in general, we have a more calcareous component in the Haveron than at Telfer, and that's indicative of the fact that the mineralization of the rock types at Haveron seem to be of the Punta Punta formation and the potentially the Wilkie Quartzite, as opposed to the Malu formation at Telfer. Now, if we want more information on the mineralogy and also potentially the textures and other little details associated with the rock types, what we do is we take a sample and we grind it down to 30 microns where we create something called a thin section and we place that under a microscope, specifically a polarizing microscope. When what that's going to do is that's going to enable us to see the minerals in that particular sample to enable us to characterize the rock type and also other features that can help us interpret what's going on at that particular deposit. And that is what these images are showing. These are all thin section images from the Mason Geoscience report from the samples that were submitted. And all of the samples that were submitted to Mason Geosciences were from a hole called HAC0301, which was located in the peripheral of the Haveron deposit. So not necessarily the centre where we're trying to focus drilling now. But what that enabled them to do was to enable to characterise the stratigraphy and also some of the processes going on. So from the top left, what we see is a rock here that contains a lot of carbonate which is these pastely coloured bits here, which is going to be uh, dolomite, calcite, but also ra these, this radiating mineral, which is actually actinolite, which is a uh, green schist metamorphic mineral. OK, down here we have a reflected light image, which is showing you the sulfides and the sulfides presence in yellow is the uh, chalcopyrite and that the white colour is actually a mix of pyrite and uh, marcasite which is replacing earlier pyrotype. In the top right, um, each sub subsequent image, by the way, is going further down in the, the drill hole. Top right, we have a vein cross-cutting this sort of white colored ground mass. This white colored ground mass is actually albite, which is an end member of one of the feldspars. Albite, typically in these rocks, is very fresh. And as such has been classed as a metamorphic variety, we do get igneous albite, we do get hydrothermal albite, but in this case it's been characterised as metamorphic. And the vein contains actinolite and also some biotite. 
And down here, again, we have an albite rich ground mass that's been cross cut by a vein which contains this brown mineral, which is actually tourmaline, suggesting a, a more magmatic input. Now, I've summarized all of the minerals on the left there. So we get albite, biotite, quartz. I've mentioned the carbon, it's tourmaline. The sulfides, which are pyrite, chalcopyrite, and pyrotite, that's ever so slightly different to telfer in the sense that we have a lot more pyrotite. And it's that that may be creating the more magnetic uh, anomaly at Haviron as compared to Telfer. So just because we see two different geophysical anomalies doesn't necessarily mean we have a different deposit type or a different metal type. Now, Mason Geosciences summarized all of their observations together. And what they interpreted was that this, uh, that Haviron aligns with the Rowan's model that I outlined earlier. So it's of syn metamorphic origin. They didn't believe that there was much of a magmatic input and they used the combina of combinations of things. Uh, they paid a lot of attention to the fact that the albite is fresh and there's a lack of sericite. But this drill hole was located on the peripheral. There is actually sericite present in some of the samples, but it's perhaps the reason why you don't see such a destruction of some of these feldspars is because this is on the peripheral of the system and quite distal that the centre of the deposit may be related to a particular fault or fracture, maybe have seen a much more focusing of the hydrothermal fluids. And therefore, in those regions, we would see a lot more alteration and a lot more destruction of, of, of uh, pre-existing minerals. OK, there is no evidence for proximal scar alteration and that the alteration that was highlighted in the Newcrest report is much more indicative of metamorphic assemblages. So some of the things they were saying was alteration is actually just normal metamorphism. But overall, what we're seeing in summary from Mason Geo Science and the observations here, a lot of similarities to Telfer, definitely some evidence of magmatic input. Um, I would say that the interpretation that they've got for the Rowan's model is pretty accurate, but needs to have that additional magmatic input um, that they kind of underestimate. So following on from that, we can say that the TELF of the Haveron mineralization is located here within the Punta Punta formation, which is a series of metamorphos, sandstones, siltstones, and carbonates, with some pelite, which is basically metamorphosed mudstone. This has occurred at green schist, green schist facies metamorphism between 350 and 450 degrees Celsius. We see metamorphic minerals present, such as tremolite, such as actinolite, maybe some chlorite. The mineralization style is quite similar to Telfer as well. We have this um, some veins, uh, replacement mineralization, and also low grade breccia, which is quite uh, prominent. Um, there is, if you look at the core photos and some of the photos of the uh, rocks from uh, Haveron, uh, some sort of reef style mineralization, although this hasn't really been clearly defined yet. Pyrite, chalcopyrite, and pyrotite are the main sulfides with a gold copper ratio of more than five. There has been some fluid inclusion work done at Haveron. Um, this is the, the phases that we identify are very similar to Telfer. We have high salinity, high, moderate to high temperature fluid inclusions that have carbonic phases present. Now, when we look at the plan view, there is a one little feature that is a little bit different. So what we have, we have this RQ at sulfide zone, which contains a lot of the sort of uh, veins and potential reef style mineralization. But we also have this breccia zone, which they've drawn here. But I'm going to extend it kind of a bit further this way because we now know it kind of goes to uh, goes further down at depth and is also open to the northwest. But we have this post mineral dike. Now, this is actually a mafic intrusive that's younger than the mineralization. So it's not causing the mineralization. It's younger and it's located at around about 600 meters of depth. And it kind of subdivides the ore body, if you like into two discrete periods. You have this this bit here and you have this bit here. Now, I don't think the mafic intrusive is of particular importance. I think all it does is it kind of just cuts through the stratigraphy. The only thing it may have done is maybe called some remobilization and maybe have added the, an additional um, sort of pressure input of fluid that could have caused further brecciation, but I don't think it's that important. The alteration we see is also pretty much the same as Telfer, silica oversaturation and sericite carbon alteration. So the point is that we have a lot of similar features to Telfer at Haveron. And this table, if there's one 
slide I want people to kind of maybe print is this one. So this is by the Sprott uh, Equity Report in um, 2019. Specifically, I want to draw attention to this man. His name's David Groves. Now, David Groves is a world leading economic geologist, academic, produced lots of papers. He was actually the man who Sprott Equity employed or consulted with to do the, um, the core study when they visited the site in 2018. So in any way, in, in, in essence, he's produced this table. What do we see? Haveron, same age, same tectonic setting, same distribution. Literally, the, the geological context is the same for Haveron as it is for Telfer. OK. We see some overlap with IOCG, but not a lot. Mineralization, I, pretty much identical to Telfer, with the exception of pyrotype being more prevalent than Haveron and also um, potentially a less reefs present at Haveron, but more veining and breccia. Alteration, pretty much identical again. We don't see the same characteristics at all with IOCG type or porphyry copper type at this stage. So what can we, what can we say now? Between the observations that I've said and this table, that Haveron is another intrusion related gold copper deposit. And that is very analogous to Telfer, with just one or two differences. So on to the future and what's coming up. Well, recently we've had a valuation placed by Hanneman Partners as of May um, this year. Um, that only takes into account the sulphide zone at Haveron. So it's quite a conservative estimate, hasn't factored in the breccia, and it also hasn't factored in the additional prospects, but it's very good that we've got another analyst covering. Um, I suppose the main uh, additional uh, focus has been Scallywag. That's located uh, a little bit um, uh, west of Haveron and is located within what looks to be this sort of antiformal, anticlinal structure here. And if we look at some more recent um, magnetics done, we have these series of targets located here and in here and in here. Um, these haven't been drilled yet. It, well, I think that the, they're planning on drilling it, but that's quite exciting. We have the right structure. We have a very similar structure to Telfer here, more so than what we have at Haveron. It's also got larger magnetic anomalies. So it could be that Scallywag could be quite an extension of Haveron towards the west and located within a structure that is favourable. That is kind of the same thing that's going on at Black Hills. So Black Hills further north, this diagram actually shows you the anticline. The anticline is going this way like that with the oldest rocks in the center and again we've had some good intercepts so the next focus really should be on scallywag and black hills and following a very similar model so to summarize haveron is analogous to telfer and is hosted within the same regional tectonic setting and geology it has a slightly stratigraphically higher host rock in the punta punta formation it has different geophysical features, but that's caused by the pyrotype uh, increase that we see at Haveron as opposed to Telfer. The mineralizing features at both deposits are very similar in terms of the style and in the mineralogy. And therefore that Haveron can be classed as another gold copper intrusion related deposit. And so to wrap up this presentation, the Neoproterozoic Unina Basin, and specifically the Lamel Group, which hosts the mineralization, is very prospective for gold copper mineralization in the past and origin. The Miles of Rogeny and the O'Callaghan Granite Super Suite generates the metamorphism heat and fluids required for a potential mineralizing system. Our fluid inclusion data, the geochronology and petrography at Telfer and Haveron point to a link between the granites and the mineralization. That Haveron can be classed as another intrusion related gold copper deposit. And that if we take into account the comments made by the Newcrest CEO, Sandy, Callum Baxter, and Gervais Heddle at Haveron, plus the observations that we are seeing, that recent estimates imply that a potential tier one deposit can be present at Haveron. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope between this one and the last one, you have a very good overview and insight into the mineralizing system at, in the Patterson. Here is all the references. If you have any questions, please email me 
or put it on the Bullington border LSE. And thank you for listening. And um, this is probably going to be the last one because unless there's a big piece of work done, but it's been uh, I've really enjoyed presenting this. And hopefully we can look forward to some better results in the future. Thank you.